Uh, greetings, everyone. This is Peg Brady at the NOAA headquarters in Silver Spring, Maryland. Welcome to the third EBSM, EBM seminar series. Welcome, everyone. Today, Isaac Kaplan from our Northwest Fishery Science Center is delivering today's presentation remotely from the Northwest, and we want to thank him. Isaac's research fishery biologist at the NOAA Fisheries Northwest Science Center in Seattle. He's a member of the Conservation Biology Division and the Integrative Marine Ecology Team and the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Team. His research collaborations involve food web modeling, bioenergetic, seasonal ocean forecasting, and end-to-end -end Atlantis uh, simulation models that include oceanography, ecology, and fishing fleet dynamics. We'll be turning this over to uh, Isaac's control, but before we do that, um, uh, Judith, do you want to give an overview of how folks can ask questions at the end? Yes, I'm Judith Salter, your librarian and host, and I will be monitoring the chat. So you're welcome to chat during the webinar or raise your hand to ask questions. We can unmute you at the end when Isaac has reserved some time for questions. The seminar is being recorded. It should be available within 48 hours at library.noaa.gov, and all of you will receive a follow-up email with you asking to give feedback about the seminar. Maybe set, make suggestions about future seminars, yes. too. That'd be great. Yeah, we'd love um, to hear from you, and we thank you for being here. Okay, um, Isaac, I think we're going to turn this over to you now and uh, give us a heads up when you're ready to conclude, and then we'll turn it over to questions. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Peg. Thanks, Judith. So today I'm going to talk about tools for evaluating trade-offs inherent in marine ecosystem-based management. And this is my perspective from Seattle. And I first want to thank, uh, first want to check the audio and make sure it's okay on your end. Um, That's fine, Isaac. Great. That's great. And thank I really you. want to thank a lot of co-authors and collaborators and reviewers, but especially lead authors and project leads, including Brandon Chasco at Oregon State. Blake Feist, Kristen Marshall, and Eric Ward at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, Tessa Francis and Andre Punt at University of Washington and Ocean Modeling Forum, Emma Hudson at Simon Fraser, and Laura Cohen at NIMF's Office of Protected Resources. And what I hope to do today is to essentially give you a peek inside the modeling toolbox that we're using on the West Coast, and in particular at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, to think about ecosystem-based management and ecosystem-based fishery management. And as I'm sure many of the, uh, the other speakers will, will talk about in this series, um, ecosystem-based management involves trade-offs between competing objectives, and evaluating those trade-offs requires some sort of model. And in my experience, that can range from a simple qualitative model or mental model up to full simulation or statistical models. And really, the, each, each tool and each question, each ecosystem-based management challenge requires the right tool. And uh, sometimes, as I'll talk about at the, the uh, end of our time today, it requires a set of tools, so some sort of multi-model inference. And what I'm going to do today is talk about some case studies. Most of these are in ecosystem-based fishery management. Um, and I'm going to show you one example in particular, thinking about wave energy that's a step towards true multi-sector ecosystem-based management beyond fisheries. And so what I'll talk about today are four case studies. Uh, the first uh, is about the competition between recovering predators and protected prey, in particular, uh, recovering marine mammals and, uh, and Chinook salmon. The second case study thinks about global trade-offs in terms of global emissions and um, ocean acidification versus local impacts on fisheries and fishing ports. The third case study focuses on energy development, uh, wave energy, and potential conflicts with other marine uses. And then the fourth case study discusses forage fish and, and sardine in particular, and trade-offs uh, trade between forage fish harvest and predator populations. And then at the end of our time today, I'd like to circle back and uh, elaborate a bit more on this forage fish example thinking about it in the context of how we use multiple models and how we go about the process of building models for EBM in a decision-relevant way. So we'll start thinking about competition between recovering predators and protected prey. And I want to, uh, first of all, thank Brandon Chasco in particular. These are his papers listed at the bottom that, that he uh, just published. And I was a collaborator on this. Um, the idea is looking at trade-offs between marine mammal populations and Chinook salmon, 
And in the context of this talk, the key tools that we applied were bioenergetics models, diet information, abundance trends, and movement patterns for predator and prey. And we're going to talk about uh, sea lions, harbor seals, orcas or killer whales, and Chinook salmon. And so the key questions in this study are, uh, first of all, what are the trends in consumption of Chinook salmon by marine mammals that have occurred over the last four decades? Then to think about how this varies in terms of uh, different predators, orcas, California and stellar sea lions, and harbor seals. How does this vary depending on whether we're thinking about adult versus juvenile Chinook salmon? And then how does it vary across space? And finally, we'll, we'll compare this uh, predation, this consumption removal, to fisheries removals. So just to give you some of the backstory here, um, a lot of the motivation for this work is rooted in killer whales or orca recovery. There was an expert panel, a blue ribbon panel, focused on the southern resonant killer whales, which are shown here in green. Uh, and you can see that other populations farther north and the other colors have recovered in recent years or are recovering, while southern resident killer whale populations have remained relatively flat. Um, and so the question is, what is preventing that species recovery? And hypotheses include factors like vessel noise and contaminants. And here we focus on prey availability, specifically availability of Chinook salmon as prey uh, to killer whales. Now, the potential competition um, and the potential impediment to prey availability to orcas is primarily coming from, uh, from pinnipeds. And so the, the key tool that Brandon Chasco developed here was a bioenergetics model estimating the total consumption needs of, of pinnipeds. And so bioenergetics models use um, estimates of species growth and metabolism and waste to estimate total consumption. And I should note that these models have been published before. So there were uh, four or five bioenergetics models that were in the literature. And uh, what Brandon did was synthesize those, put those in one nice uh, publicly available R code base, um, and use that to look and take a, synop a synoptic view at predation by marine mammals, recovering marine mammal populations, and pinnipeds in particular. And so what these bioenergetics models do is they allow us to estimate the energetic needs per predator per day. And so not surprisingly, the largest predators like orcas, killer whales, have the highest energetic needs per day. Um, we can also take that and look at the fraction of that energy that uh, comes from Chinook salmon. And we see that species like uh, orcas are salmon specialists. They're eating most of their diets coming from Chinook salmon. Other species, so the pinnipeds in particular, have relatively low fractions of their diet coming from salmon, uh, from Chinook salmon, uh, but numerically, these pinniped populations are increasing uh, their, their abundant species and they're increasing and potentially um, driving competition with orcas. And so this study looked at the spatial distribution of uh, the overlap of predator and prey from central California up to the Gulf of Alaska. And I just want to discuss very briefly some of the model inputs. And so these included the abundance of predators, so abundance trends of predators, the location of those predators, the bioenergetics models that I mentioned before, diet information, information about the production of, of uh, Chinook salmon, both wild and hatchery fish, movement patterns, so estimating the, the overlap of predator and prey, energy content and growth of salmon, and fisheries catches. And it sounds like a lot of accounting, and it, it really is, uh, but I think, as many of you know, as we uh, take on these ecosystem-based management questions. Um, this sort of, of detailed accounting of sources of mortality and of pressures and, and demands on the system is quite typical. And uh, that's, that's something that, uh, that Brandon Chasco led here and led to the results I'll show you in a second. So the take-home message from the study really is that over the last four decades, we've seen a strong increase in predation if we think about um, uh, predation just in terms of tons of Chinook salmon removed by marine mammals, we've seen about a 150% increase in that predation over the last 40 years and about a 40% decline in fishing 
as fishing for Chinook salmon has been scaled back uh, to promote recovery. Uh, we can look at this both on the coastwide level and for these uh, the eight regions that I just showed you. So these plots show us um, in the solid black line the uh, fisheries removals, which have generally been declining through time. And then the hatched colors here, the, uh, the, the gray and the lighter gray, are consumption of wild Chinook salmon and hatchery Chinook salmon by the aggregated populations of the four marine mammals. And so what we see both at the coastwide level here in the top left and, the, um, uh, and for each of our regions, which are the other panels, we see that generally fishing has declined uh, consumption by marine mammals has increased, and right now at the coastwide level and for most of our regions, we see that predation is greater uh, than fisheries removals. And that's true regardless of whether we look at the uh, consumption and removal in terms of the number of fish, which is the left-hand axis here, or the biomass or tons, which are the right-hand axes. So increases in, in predation driven by those increases in marine mammal populations and in particular recovering pinniped populations. The story is a bit nuanced. If we look at uh, predation of, Chinook, of juvenile Chinook salmon here on the left versus adult Chinook salmon on the right, when we're looking at juvenile Chinook, the harbor seals are the dominant consumers. And that's true regardless of whether we look at the uh, the panel here in the top left, which is looking at the biomass of juvenile Chinook salmon consumed, or their numbers. In both of those cases, the harbor seals are focusing on juveniles, uh, in particular at, at, at the river mouth and near shore areas, and the harbor seals are the dominant predators. If we're talking about adult Chinook salmon in the right-hand plots here, killer whales or orcas are the dominant predators. Recovery of those orcas is driving the increase in predation on adult Chinook salmon. And of course, that recovery is only happening for some of the orca populations, some of the killer whale populations. But overall, that's driving that increase in both biomass consumed and numbers consumed of adult Chinook salmon. And so just to conclude with this, this, with this example from the, the modeling toolkit, uh, we see that predation by marine mammals may now exceed fisheries in most regions and at the, at the coastwide region as well, the coastwide level as well. Total removals, so if we sum harvest and predation, total, removal, total removals are actually increasing. So in some ways, this is a success story for salmon recovery. It's just that a lot of this production has now been shifted towards feeding marine mammals as opposed to going towards the fisheries harvest. Increasingly, I think we're going to see situations like this, and certainly at the global level, we're seeing these trade-offs between rebounding predators, including pinnipeds, and endangered predators and prey. And I just wanted to mention that we have different levels of precision for the inputs, and this was addressed in the papers with uh, pretty detailed sensitivity analyses. But we have, for these species, including the mammals and the salmon, we have quite precise abundance estimates. The diet information is less precise and is really the subject of a lot of the uh, sensitivity analyses. And then increasingly, we're able to, to use some new genetic techniques on SCAT, on pinniped SCAT, to get some, some better diet information. In the context of this talk, tools for the job include bioenergetics models, diet information, abundance trends, and movement patterns. Okay, so I want to talk about the next case study, which is really talking about uh, global change versus local impacts on fisheries. The focus here is on ocean acidification and the California current. I want to thank in particular co-authors, including Kristen Marshall and Emma Hodson. So one paper published last year and one in review. And the key tools here are ROMS oceanographic projections, a meta-analysis of experimental results, an Atlantis end-to-end -end model, and an economics model, which is an input-output model. So as many of you know, ocean acidification has been dubbed the, the evil twin of global warming. And so as we put more CO2 into the atmosphere, uh, we see uh, consumption of carbonate ions and uh, species that need, to, that need calcification, like shelled species, have a harder time existing and surviving. 
That's true for shelled species and also for some, uh, some non-shelled species, potentially including fish. In the top right corner here, we see pteropods. Uh, pteropods are sort of the poster child for effects, uh, quite visible effects of low pH or ocean acidification impacting uh, their, their shell structure. And so the approach for this question to think about ocean acidification in the California current was to use uh, sort of three pieces of the puzzle. The first is an oceanographic model, a ROMS model projecting 2060s pH and other ocean conditions and comparing that to 2010, uh, conditions in the 2010s. And this was the work of Al Herman at PMEL. The second part of the, the puzzle here was a very detailed literature review of over 300 studies. And this was published by Shallon Bush and Paul McElhaney in 2016. And so it was a, a meta-analysis estimating the relative sensitivity of species in the California current to declines in pH. And so we could use this to build scenarios, scenarios for species sensitivity, and to feed those into the Atlantis ecosystem model that's shown here on the right. And that model includes oceanography, biogeochemistry, um, ecology, including food web interactions, and then human impacts, especially fisheries. Uh, this Atlantis model um, was implemented in a couple of papers uh, last year uh, by Kristen Marshall and myself. The geographic domain is shown here. We have fairly high resolution, as you can see on the left and right side of the screen, so fairly high resolution near the coast, uh, much coarser resolution farther offshore, extending to the 200 nautical mile limit to the extent of the EEZ. Um, and I should mention that this the modeling framework, the Atlantis framework, is a code base, a very flexible code base from Beth Fulton at CSIRO in Australia. So this end-to-end -end model includes the full food web. So that means species including primary producers and invertebrates, fish and cephalopods, and seabirds, sharks, and marine mammals. And the idea is to uh, consider scenarios with direct impacts, in particular impacts on the invertebrates, and to look and see how those play through the food web um, up through predators and, uh, and competitors in, in the ecosystem. And so the key questions of these two papers were, uh, what are the effects of forecasted 2060, uh, 2060 pH levels on the biomass of species that we directly specify as being sensitive to pH, to ocean acidification? What are the indirect effects on their predators and prey? And what are the effects on fisheries revenue at the port level? And so I'm just gonna show you a couple result slides here from these papers. This shows you the, the biomass response of species in the food web to the sensitivity to 2060s pH. And so uh, negative responses here mean declines in biomass of species in the Atlantis ecosystem model. Open circles are the responses of individual groups in the model. And then the solid circles here are the responses of the average within a guild. And so the x-axis here is the species guild, such as mammals and seabirds and sharks. And there are different scenarios that we ran that are represented by the different colors. So for instance, scenarios specifying that some of the benthos were sensitive to declines in pH, or the copepods, or crab and shrimp. I think what we should look at right now is just a cumulative scenario, which is essentially assuming that the top 10 groups that the literature review suggested were sensitive were forced to have these direct impacts. And then we can look and see what happens to other species in the food web. And so that's the black bars here. And so we see direct impacts, for instance, on filter feeders. So many of these, uh, for instance, shelled bivalves. We see those direct impacts. We see impacts on some of the crabs. So the, the epizobenthos guild here includes the crabs. And they're suffering sort of from a double whammy from direct impacts um, due to difficulties with calcification, and then also from indirect impacts as that benthic food web changes. And then we see additional indirect food web effects on demersal fish in particular, and on some of the shark species as well. Now, of this previous slide, 
Um, each of these species has different economic values and different ports that targets it. And we can look and see what these declines in biomass and related declines in catch mean in terms of revenue, income, and employment at the port level. And this is the work of Emma Hodson. And so what she's done is calculated port level revenue on the left and then used an input-output econ model from Jerry Leonard to translate this into income and jobs at the port level. And so what we see is that although some of the sharks and groundfish are declining, the strongest economic impacts are driven by Dungeness crab. And because our northern ports, because the, the Oregon and Washington ports are most reliant on Dungeness crab, we see the strongest economic impacts on those ports. And so that's the, the red and orange colors that you see here. Um, due to that decline in Dungeness crab in particular. And so the take home messages here are that we see direct effects of ocean acidification on invertebrates and some other species as well. We know that primarily from the, the literature review, the meta-analysis by uh, Bush and McElhaney. We see indirect effects throughout the food web on some demersal fish and sharks and also on Dungeness crab, which is one of our high value species. And just to sort of bring this to a personal level, essentially it means that we see trade-offs, global trade-offs between CO2 emissions driven by individual choices of minivan drivers like myself. And we see those trade-offs between that global CO2 and ocean acidification effect and local impacts on ports and people that rely on Dungeness crab. Um, those effects are on invertebrate fisheries, and in particular, some of the state-managed invertebrate fisheries. So our Dungeness crab fishery is managed by the states, not by the federal government. Uh, those effects were strongest in the north, and some other fisheries and species, for instance, the pelagic species, were less influenced by these scenarios of future pH, future ocean acidification. And so in the context of this talk, the tools for the job included a ROMS oceanographic model, the meta-analysis of the experimental and laboratory results, the Atlantis end-to-end -end model, and the input-output economics model. Okay, and so the third out of the four case studies that I want to mention today uh, involves energy development versus other marine uses. This is the only case study today that I did not collaborate on. Uh, this is the work of Mark Plummer and Blake Feist, and it's uh, really applying a, a really nice set of tools. So ecosystem service valuation, uh, specifically of wave energy, a collection of an amazing amount of spatial data on human uses, vessel monitoring data, and a lot of GIS work. And their citation is here at the bottom. And so following up on those the previous slides about ocean acidification, we can think about um, ways to mitigate global CO2, rising CO2, ocean acidification, and global warming. And those might include efforts like uh, wave energy and wind energy and alternative sources of power. For wave energy specifically, here uh, Blake and Mark were interested in the potential wave energy and power patterns off the west coast of the U.S. And then conflicts that might arise from overlap within uh, with existing marine uses. And I just want to acknowledge some of the, uh, the uh, tools that they were using. The wave energy model uh, and the invest tools were developed uh, by the uh, Natural Capital Project and uh, published, among other places, by Kim et al. in, in uh, PLOS One. And so using those tools, Lake and Mark looked at the wave energy potential along the U.S. West Coast, and so that's what you see here in this left-hand plot. So this is the essentially the raw wave energy potential with red indicating the highest potential wave energy. Um, and so we can see that the key step here is translating that wave energy into actual net present value in terms of the energy that can be captured and delivered uh, to cities and to users on the coast. Um, the main result, the thing I learned uh, first from this study is that translating from wave energy to power involves having the right infrastructure and having the right grid connections, the right connections to the electrical grid at specific points along the coast. And so those 
places where you have the grid connections, you can have a positive net present value, so a positive economic potential for wave energy, and those specific places are shown here on the right-hand plot in green. Other places may have the wave energy, but they don't have the grid connections uh, to, to bring that power to, to people. And so the next step of this uh, was to ask, well, there may be some areas that have positive net present value, but what are the potential conflicts? What are the potential other human uses? And so for this, uh, Blake Feist and Mark Plummer assembled information on fishing effort, so observer information, vessel monitoring information on fleets, including fleets for which we don't have observer data, vessel traffic information or AIS information that among other things shows the shipping lanes for cargo ships and tugs and towing and other vessels, and then critical habitat and protected areas, including green sturgeon, uh, critical habitat, sanctuaries, national marine sanctuaries, essential fish habitat, and no-take areas, typically within state waters. And so what you can do here is look at the areas with positive net present value, so positive economic value that, that could come from wave energy, and then look at the basically the sum of the potential conflicts with these other uses. And that's what's highlighted here in the different colors. So zero means that a cell has zero conflicts between positive wave energy potential and human uses. Uh, red and black mean very high conflicts, more conflicts with multiple uses, uh, including, for instance, fishing and shipping and, uh, and critical habitat. And so, for instance, what we see is areas off the Columbia River and uh, the northern tip of Washington, where there may be positive potential for wave energy, but very high conflicts with other uses. And then we have some other regions where there's a, uh, uh, quite a bit more promise for wave energy and reducing conflicts at the same time. And so, for instance, uh, the green areas, so farther south in Washington and uh, in central Oregon. And so the conclusion from this was that uh, there is an amazing amount of wave energy potential. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it is far from human populations. And so the potential to actually bring that uh, in an economically sensible way to, to human use is really dictated by those grid connections and by infrastructure. Uh, nonetheless, there are potential resource conflicts with commercial fishing, vessel traffic, sanctuaries, and critical habitat. Um, but we really need to think about these, and this is this is an example where we start to think about true multi-sector ecosystem-based management. And I think in this particular case, it really really illustrated that we have to think beyond fisheries, and this is in particular for folks like myself in the fisheries service. We have to think beyond fisheries, and just as an example of that, um, in this paper, Blake and Mark calculated the total uh, total annual net revenue from bottom trawl and compared it to uh, potential revenue from wave energy, and in almost all cells along the coast, we see orders of magnitude higher economic potential from wave energy versus the bottom trawl fishery. So that's just an example, not to say that wave energy will, will uh, take over the entire coast, but I think it certainly illustrates that we need to think about these other sectors and think about these competing uses along the coast. Okay, and I just want to wrap up talking about the harvest of uh, forage fish versus predator populations. Uh, in particular, to think about sardine and anchovy, and some of our predators in the California current. And I'd like to thank co-authors, including Andre Punt and Laura Cohen, whose papers are listed here. And the key tools that I'll talk about here are multi-species models, in particular an ecopath model, a mice model, and an Atlantis model. And so the context for this work has been a steep decline in sardine abundance in recent decades. Uh, well, sorry, in recent years. Uh, this is a plot of sardine uh, stock biomass from the 2017 stock assessment. At the same time that the sardine abundance has declined, uh, we've had a very low abundance of anchovy as well. And that's likely important for pelican, California sea lion, and other predators in our, in our region. And so the goals of this broader case study were, first of all, to synthesize really decades worth of sardine ecology and sardine management, 
to bring experts together to, to leverage a lot of previous work. Secondly, to look at possible ecosystem and population responses to declines in sardine abundance. And the third goal here in the, in the broader context was to really get modelers in the same room and have us understand the strengths and limitations and caveats of each of our modeling approaches. Many of us are, ex are experts in one or two particular approaches, uh, but this was a chance to get us all in the room to really hash through uh, how to work on these problems. Um, and finally, the, the ultimate goal is to provide the Fishery Council with information about, uh, about these species and about forage fish impacts on predators. And uh, we had a, a recent briefing in October, actually, of one of the management teams, the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team, about this work. And so I'm going to talk about three models, um, the Atlantis model, the Ecopath model, and the MICE. The MICE is a model of intermediate complexity for ecosystem assessments, just sort of a stripped-down multi-species model. And the spatial domain of those models is shown here. Um, the MICE model has a, a it, again, it's sort of a stripped-down simplified approach. So it has space in a simple representation shown here by the green horizontal lines with 13 bins, 13 spatial bins. The Atlantis model, as I mentioned before, is a, uh, a spatially detailed model with these irregularly shaped polygons that you see on this map. And then the Ecopath model is a simple static food web approach that is not spatially explicit, but is meant to represent the area inshore of the 2,000 meter isobath. And so the key thing is that we had multiple models here, and each one had a really useful role to play. For the Ecopath model, uh, the, the, the first benefit from it really was to think about what are the, the key predators and prey in the species, and in, in the ecosystem, and an example of that is shown here. So we see predator diet proportion on the x-axis, and each of the predators on the y-axis, and consumption of anchovy, herring, and sardine in each of these plots. And we see, for instance, that brown pelican and sea lions consume fairly large amounts in terms of their diet proportion of sardine. And those same species uh, also consume anchovy, with brown pelican probably uh, more dependent on anchovy and sea lions also eating them as well. And so the Ecopath model helped us to identify what are the key predators and also to think about some of these prey species, for instance, including anchovy in the analyses as well as sardine. Again, in this multi-model context, we were able to apply each model and really benefit from the strengths of each one. So for instance, for the MICE model, it's a simplified, sort of minimally complex approach. It included just sardine, anchovy, and then two other forage fish groups, so a relatively simple forage fish community. Um, the benefit of that is that it gave us uh, very fast run times, so we were able to have uh, thousands of simulated years and full Monte Carlo draws. The Atlantis model has the intent of looking at the broader food web. So it's a much slower model. It takes much longer to run. But we're able to look at a broader set of the species, including jack mackerel and squid and mctophids and, and other uh, small pelagic fish. For the predators, again, the mice model is small and fast and nimble. It's just focused on California sea lion and brown pelican. For the Atlantis model, we're representing more of the food web. We can get a broader look at the cost of uh, a limited number of runs, but we are able to look at 48 fish, mammals, and birds, and sharks. And as is often the case with Atlantis, we, we had a bit more aggregation than we would have liked. So we had brown pelican aggregated into a pelagic feeding seabird group uh, in comparison to the mice where we had a very focused brown pelican uh, analysis. And so the key questions for this analysis were, uh, what is the change in the rest of the food web that results from depletion of sardine? What is the effect on fished predators and unfished predators? And I'm going to show you the mice results first and then combine them with the Atlantis results. And so uh, the distribution of sea lion abundances is shown here on the top. The expected distribution of pelican abundance is shown on the bottom. And uh, these distributions are for cases where we had very high sardine abundance, so over 4 million, well, typically 4 million or more metric ton, metric tons of sardine. 
And we see in these cases that California sea lion, the sea lion abundance doesn't fluctuate very much. It it's, uh, has a fairly tight distribution. Pelican, because they are relying on more variable species, including anchovy, tend to have a broader distribution and even years where pelican abundance is quite low. So approaching uh, very low abundance of, of pelican, even in, in this case, this yellow case here, where we have high sardine abundance. Now, if we shift this and start looking at cases and uh, simulations and ye simulated years with lower abundances of sardine, we're shifting to these orange cases and the red cases with very low abundance of sardine. Here we see minimal impact on the, on the sea lions projected by the mice model. So essentially no shift in the expected number of sea lions. Pelicans on the other hand shift. So we expect about a 29% decline in pelican abundance as we shift from the yellow case to the red case or from the high sardine abundance to the low sardine abundance. So these are the mice results and we can combine these with results from Atlantis. So I'll spend a couple minutes on this plot to walk you through it. Um, the x-axis here is the sardine abundance ranging from very high sardine abundance, so around 4 million metric tons on the left, to low sardine abundance on the right. Groups or species within the model are shown here by row. And we can see the mice results, so just echoing the results we just saw. We see the mice results, so as we move from left to right, from high sardine abundance to low sardine abundance, there is minimal impact projected by mice on California sea lion and stronger impacts, so that 29% decline in brown pelicans. And so here, uh, red and orange are declines, green are slight increases, and blue are strong increases. We can compare that to Atlantis results. So here in the black rows, we see California sea lions. So a, uh, a Again, a slight decline in sea lions in Atlantis, just as in mice. And for seabirds, we see a, a, a slightly stronger response, uh, not as strong as the brown pelican decline in the mice, uh, but that's because the Atlantis model uh, includes pelicans, but aggregates them with other species that tend to rely less heavily on sardine and anchovy as well. So the benefit of having multiple models here is that we're able to uh, gain from insights, in particular, the insights from the Atlantis model where we can see uh, impacts throughout the food web. So in particular, we see declines projected as we move from left to right, or as we move from high sardine abundance to low ab abundance. We see some declines projected for dolphins and for one of the flatfish groups, which includes California halibut. We also see some increases in some of the competitors and prey items for sardine. And those include species like mctophids and other, other planktivorous fish, and then some of the zooplankton groups. And I should say this, this is really fuel for additional empirical analyses, in particular on the plankton side, and then potentially motivation for including species like dolphins or California halibut in additional focused mice models. So just to wrap up the sardine case study, um, I think that this was a case where we had multiple models that we could bring to bear on the question. It really illustrates the value of simple models, like the Ecopath model, getting the diet information together, identifying the key predators and prey in the system. Um, the mice and Ecopath model identify brown pelicans as, as most sensitive to sardine declines. Mice, Atlantis, and Ecopath also identify sea lions as less sensitive. Um, the MICE model with its thousands of simulated years and Monte Carlo approach gives us uh, true probability distributions or probability distributions that we can look at, um, but we can also sort of force those into a comparison with Atlantis and other approaches, including some extensions of Ecosim and Ecopath. The Atlantis model identifies species that the MICE model might consider in the future, like some of the dolphins and, and halibut and, for instance, some of the birds. And then really forcing modelers to, to talk about their models, to interact, to build models in a co-developed way, really help us understand how taxonomic resolution matters and how assumptions within the model structure, for instance, about age composition and density dependence really influences results. So that was a benefit of, of having this collaborative effort. And again, in the context of this talk, the tools that we applied were multi-species models 
in particular Ecopath, Mice, and Atlantis. And so I just want to conclude by uh, talking a bit more about this, this last sardine case study, but thinking about it in the context of applying these multiple models and, and um, organizing model development in a, in a way that really feeds into decision making. So I wanted to point out that my contribution to this sardine case study was facilitated by the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment and also by the Ocean Modeling Forum. And there's a, a paper in prep by Tessa Francis uh, really detailing the, the evolution of the Ocean Modeling Forum. Um, but it's been a way to apply multiple models and really develop them in the uh, decision support context. Uh, the forum really gets together, uh, assembles managers and scientists to use models to tackle complex ocean questions. And our goal so far has been to build decision-relevant models that are aspirational, applicable, parsimonious, co-developed, and amplifying. And I just wanted to highlight uh, that this is an example where we've been able to literally uh, <laughs> Uh, invite decision makers to the party. So these pictures are from a herring case study. So there was a sort of a sister approach to the sardine case study, a herring case study in uh, British Columbia and Haida Gwaii. And this has brought together tribal elders, tribal scientists, uh, federal scientists, uh, and stakeholders. And here you have uh, uh, folks talking through the details of their analyses, working on models together, and trying to, uh, to, to solve ocean issues related to herring. The Ocean Modeling Forum uh, has really embraced the philosophy that we know that all models are imperfect, all models are wrong, uh, but bringing multiple models to the table helps us understand uh, which models are less wrong <laughs> and really embraces the approach that uh, having an ensemble, for instance, in the climate modeling approach or the weather forecasting approach helps us get better predictions and helps us understand when, we are, when our models are most right. Okay, and with that, I would, um, I'm gonna conclude and wrap up in just a minute and take questions. I hope that these slides today gave you a peek into the ecosystem modeling toolbox for ecosystem-based management on the West Coast. Um, as many of you know, ecosystem-based management involves trade-offs between competing objectives. Those trade-offs require models, including models of the types I've shown today and, and many others. I think, each challenge in ecosystem-based management really requires a tailored set of models. And as the last case study, the Sardine case study illustrates, sometimes it's best to have multiple models to bring to bear to a question. And then finally, I think that the wave energy case study in particular really illustrates that ecosystem-based uh, fishery management might be what's on our plate, what's on many of our plates right now. But full ecosystem-based management, considering multiple sectors, uh, including energy, is probably in our future. And so with that, I'm going to uh, conclude. I want to thank um, some, some funders and some collaborators. And I'm glad to hand it back to Judith and Peg for questions. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much, Isaac. Uh, appreciate that. That was an excellent presentation overview. Uh, we're checking online. We do not see any questions at this point, but please uh, feel free to raise your hand there online, and Judith will uh, give us a question. We have a few folks here in the room at the NOAA Library in Silver Spring, so i would open it up to those folks as well if there are any questions. Nope. Okay. Oh, we just received one from online. Okay, go ahead. We have one online, uh, Isaac. We'll, we'll get it for you. How were sea lions and brown pelicans selected for the mice model? Great. So how were sea lions and brown pelicans selected uh, for the mice model? So that, that's really the benefit of having the ecopath model in hand. Um, so Laura Cohen's uh, ecopath work and some previous work uh, by Amber Sobolazai really assembled the diet information um, and identified the key prey and predators in this forage fish context. And so it's really based on that ecopath model uh, that we selected those predators, including sea lions uh, and pelicans. Okay. 
and and there's certainly I mean there's certainly a lot of supporting literature there, uh, even going back to the 70s. The the anchovy management plan uh, considered brown pelicans as one of the species that should be uh, of concern in the forage fish context. And uh, additionally, um, we've seen in particular low pup survival of California sea lions uh, in recent years in Southern California. And so those are there's lots of literature to suggest that um, these are predators that are important to think about in the, the uh, context of forage fish. Thank you, Isaac. We're still searching online for other questions. We'll stand by for a little bit here, Isaac. If folks don't have a question today, they can certainly uh, submit, a, uh, submit a question uh, with respect to their response uh, after the talk. And obviously, they will have access uh, to the audio as well as to the presentation um, in the next 48 hours. Okay. And I'm also out in Seattle, and you're welcome to contact me, um, including by email, which is listed here on this last slide. Another question. Brian, is there a mechanism or toolbox to run Atlantis in an ensemble mode? Hear that, Isaac? Yes. Uh, so, is there a mechanism to run Atlantis in an ensemble mode? Um, so that that question is about Atlantis specifically. So, yeah. So the the context there is that Atlantis is a very slow model to run. So we're talking um, hours to days to do a single simulation. So it's more like some of our physical oceanographic models than it is like a mice model. It's um, it, it takes quite a bit of computing power, and so uh, so yeah. So in Seattle and in um, at other institutes, including in Norway and and Australia, we are developing ways to uh, to sort of ramp up the number of simulations that we can handle. Uh, so I'm not sure if I would call it a true ensemble mode. Uh, but we're getting to the point now where we can do uh, hundreds of runs, perhaps not the thousands that you would see in a simple model like mice, but certainly hundreds of runs. And I should also say that the um, part of the art of these, these full end-to-end -end models is trying to identify the key sources of uncertainty and use those to, uh, to sort of create the end members of the ensemble. So what are the, typically what are the high and low productivity states of the species that you're interested in? And so we've done some of that uh, sort of very simple bracketing of uncertainty, which is a step towards that ensemble approach. Uh, and we've, we've done some of that in the context of some groundfish um, environmental impact statements out on the West Coast. But certainly the solution is more computing, and we're, we're moving to that now as are other institutes across the world who are using this particular platform. A question from Carolyn. How are the results of modeling ground truth Sure. So um, I guess I'm not sure exactly uh, which, uh, which model Carolyn's asking about. I mean, all of these models uh, need to be ground truth, and they're, they're uh, ground truth in different ways. So when possible, I would certainly advocate uh, fitting models to data in a true statistical approach. And a, a really good MICE model, a model of intermediate complexity, like the one that I was talking about uh, with Sardine, is fitted to data in a statistical way, just like a stock assessment is. And then the, the sort of ground truthing approaches vary depending on uh, which of the other models you're talking about. Um, but I would point to some, some recent skill assessment work uh, by Eric Olson and colleagues at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, uh, looking at, very specifically looking at skill assessment metrics, which is uh, essentially saying uh, ground truthing uh, so skill assessment of end-to-end -end models like Atlantis and uh, looking to see if they capture uh, observed trends in species abundance and catch and ecosystem properties. And uh, for that, I'd point you to a, uh, Eric Olson paper uh, that's titled, Yes, We Can. <laughs> okay. Um, that concludes the questions, but there may be some follow-up questions that can get submitted, and we'll send them on to you, Isaac, when you see the analytics from the presentation. So thank you so much for volunteering your time today and also sharing information from your all your teams and all the teams that support the work that you've uh, presented on today.
Uh, thank you to everyone for your interest, and thanks very much to Peg and Judith as well. Thank you. Uh, and for those folks that are still online, uh, just a note about our next presentation. These are a monthly, offered monthly on the second Wednesday uh, of every month. Our next speaker is Brian Wells from the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center, and that will be on Wednesday, February 14th, Valentine's Day. And it's entitled, The Process Studies to Quantify Ecosystem Dynamics and Inform Ecosystem-Based Fishery Management in the Central California Current. So please join us, register for that next uh, uh, presentation, and we look forward to connecting with you next month. Thanks so much for everyone's attention.